Uh, hurry, Mr. Zavone. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to Spokane City Council Legislative Agenda okay. session. Thank you. Lori Kinnear, I'm Spokane Council President Pro Tem, filling in for Council Member, Council President Beggs, who will be returning next week. Can I get a amen? Amen again. Okay. You're still doing a great job. Uh, yeah, You're doing a great fantastic. job. So thank you all for being here. All please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This district, could we have the roll? Council President Pro Tem Kinnear. Present. Council Member Bingle. Present. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Stratton. Present. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Zappone. Here. Let the record reflect that Council President Beggs is absent. Soon to be back, okay. We have six proclamations tonight, wow. so I hope you all um, brought your patience. <laughs> the first one is going to be foster care appreciation. Uh, Mr. Zappone? That's me. Whereas we, have a, whoa, that was loud. <laughs> Whereas we have a responsibility as individuals, neighbors, and community members to recognize that all children need love, support, security, and a place to call home, and whereas there are nearly 1,000 children experiencing foster care in Spokane and 450 foster families open their homes to provide a stable, nurturing environment, and whereas we must come together as a community to recognize the important role foster parents play in caring for children who have experienced abuse, neglect, or loss, supporting family reunification and building strong communities. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Foster Care Appreciation Month in Spokane and encourage all citizens to celebrate those who have invited a child in need into their hearts and homes, and we express our profound appreciation for those who make foster care possible. Do we have a representative to accept okay. this? Great, you wanna come up to the podium. Did you, did you wanna say a few words? I apologize. Thank you so much for this uh, proclamation. Uh, my name is Scott Ferguson, the executive director of Embrace Washington, a local nonprofit here in Spokane that uh, directly serves the foster care community. I'm joined by the regional administrator um, of Region 1 of the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, Jeff Kincaid, our board chair, Julie Kelsey, as well as our founder, Aline Alexander. And from all of us, thank you for recognizing how valuable it is to honor the families who open up their homes, who have a heart to ensure that every child in Spokane in our area feels love and compassion and care. So we appreciate this very much and thank you for honoring May as Foster Care Appreciation Month. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if Mr. Lopez could come up. I'm gonna read the EMS proclamation. You wanna come up? Whereas emergency medical services are a vital public service which consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, educators, administrators, trained members of the public and other out of office medical care providers. And whereas emergency medical services have grown to fill a gap by providing important out of hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow up care, and access to telemedicine and the members of emergency medical services teams engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance these life-saving skills. And whereas the members of the city's emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury. 
Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim May 15 through 21st, 2022, as Emergency Medical Services Week in Spokane, and with the EMS strong theme, EMS rising to the challenge, we encourage the community to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Thank you. Please say a few words. Well, thank you on behalf of all the men and women of the Spokane Fire Department uh, and our partner agency, uh, American Medical Response. Uh, we appreciate your recognition of the great work they, that they do. Um, we've been operating in unprecedented times like all of us have, but uh, particularly in, in the EMS field where uh, they had to jump in uh, dealing with an unknown disease, trying to craft uh, ways to protect themselves and also to protect others, um, and yet still uh, did a phenomenal job in, in providing care. Uh, we saw no declination in the, um, the performance based on our clinical key performance indicators over the last two years, and I think that's just a tribute to the, to the folks that are out there doing it. So thank you very much. Mike, don't go anywhere. Yeah, you might. <laughs> I have the privilege of reading a salutation to Mike Lopez, who I have known for more years than I can remember, still doing the work he's doing today, serving in the community. Whereas Mike Lopez announced his retirement as the Integrated Medical Services Manager for the City of Spokane, effective May 19, 2022. And during his 49 years of dedicated service in the pre-hospital emergency medical discipline, Mr. Lopez has been an enthusiastic innovator pushing for and accomplishing profound medical advances for the state of Washington and especially the city of Spokane. And whereas during his service to the city, Mr. Lopez was a key member of the Spokane Fire Department's core leadership team and helped navigate the organization through adversity, challenges, and the pandemic, as well as assisting with the development of the Fire Department's Leadership Development Academy, and was a key member in the team that established the Fire Department's, the Fire Department's first strategic plan, which the city has maintained every year since. Whereas Mr. Lopez has demonstrated unique dedication to the city, region, and state continuing to work despite all adversity and has also been incredibly, and I can second that, involved in the community over the past 49 years, volunteering as a Spokane Treatment and Recovery Services Board member, Hospice of Spokane Board member, chairperson for the Eastern Region EMS and Trauma Care Council, and chairperson of the Spokane County EMS and in his younger days, serve on the board of the American Heart Association. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby salute Mike Lopez for his loyal and distinguished service to our community and to the Spokane Fire Department. Thank you very much. I'm humbled, and I appreciate it so much. And uh, I, yeah, I don't know what to say. I was telling a uh, couple people tonight that I, I don't know that I was really good at what I did. You just hang around for 50 years, and by nature, you just kind of <laughs> absorb things. So um, I've just been blessed to work with great people, have the support of great people, um, and that really is is it so i again i'm just very humbled and very thankful thank you no, thank you mike okay 
Next up is Council Member Stratton, Lilac Festival Week. We have Alan Hart. Do you want to bring up the court as well? I gotta get into order. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you and um, thank you for joining us. I have to tell you though, it took a lot of control on my part <laughs> because I wanted to sit up here and read my speech that I gave before the Spokane audience many years ago at the Lilac Coronation, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. <laughs> We're gonna honor you. <laughs> But every Lilac time I queen, see, right? yeah. I was Lilac Queen, 1977. Yes. So every time I see crowns, that's I go right to those days. Whereas the Spokane Lilac Festival honors our military, recognizes our youth, and showcases our region by holding the largest armed forces torchlight parade in the nation for 84 years. And whereas the Spokane Lilac Festival operated entirely by volunteers and the Royal Court promote the Greater Spokane community, serving as ambassadors to over 20 outlying parades and festivals each year, while showcasing Spokane as one of the greatest tourist destinations in the Inland Northwest. And whereas the Spokane Lilac Festival Association embraces this year's theme, Our Town, welcoming families and guests to join together in celebration all week long as we honor our nation's heroes and empower tomorrow's leaders. Now therefore I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane and one old Lilac Queen, do hereby proclaim May 15th through the 21st, 2022 Lilac Festival Week in Spokane and invite all citizens of Spokane, Spokane County and the greater inland Northwest area to enjoy and participate in the numerous activities hosted throughout the week, concluding with the Spokane Lilac Festival Armed Forces Torchlight Parade in downtown Spokane on Saturday, May 21st. Please, please say a few words for us. Thank you. Well, I'm Alan Hart. I am the president of Lilac Festival this year. I, it's a great honor to actually be the president this year. Um, and I really just want to say, come out to the parade on Saturday. It's going to be a great time. We have a lot of great activities coming up out on Saturday uh, that I know everyone in the region will be able to enjoy. So I want to introduce Queen Jana, <clears throat> excuse me, from Mead High School. If you could come on up, please. And we have some pins for all the council members oh. if we can approach yes, uh, afterwards. Please, please do. Okay. Thank you, council members, for working tirelessly to make our town a place where people want to live and want to visit for the festival. Uh, we look forward to celebrating our town with you. I think right now a parade is really needed and we're ready to celebrate a new beginning. We would love to have you guys join us Yeah, on our parade um, on Saturday, the 21st. Thank you. Queen Jenny, can you introduce your court, please? Yes. This is Princess Ryan from Gonzaga Preparatory High School, Princess Shelby from University High School, Princess Valerie from Medical Lake High School, Princess Ella from Cheney High School, Princess Megan from the Oaks Classical Christian Academy, and Princess Taryn from Ferris High School. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm going to give you a pin. Oh, oh good. I love those. Thank you. And I think we have one for the council president, too. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You guys have a good time. That's awesome. Okay. Did we all get one? I got one. Yes. We got it. Okay. I got one for Brian. Okay. We got him. We did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I want to put this on without stabbing myself. Um, next up is Mr. Bingle. You're going to do a... Um, George McGrath's salutation. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas... Before you start, did you want the... Is it, who's receiving this? Yes. Come on up. So I never had the, the pleasure of meeting Mr. George McGrath, but uh, many in here uh, did. And um, whether they agreed with him or not, uh, he was well respected um, by many in our building. So whereas George McGrath, a regular Monday night council meeting attendee and testifier, passed away on May 1st, 2022. And whereas, as written in the spokesman review, George McGrath was never elected to the Spokane City Council, but probably attended more Monday night council meetings than any member, past or present. And whereas public testimony is an essential component of a well-functioning government, and McGrath never shied away from speaking his mind, even when it resulted in his removal from council chambers or in having a trademark phrase banned from city council meetings. And whereas McGrath's testimony inspired the one and only puppet show to ever take place in council chambers during a city council meeting, and whereas those with, Mc, those with whom McGrath did not always agree still felt the utmost respect for his consistent and passionate engagement with local government, and whereas both McGrath and his Tickle Me Elmo sweatshirt will be greatly missed at future city council meetings, now therefore, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the community members of Spokane, hereby salute George McGrath, for his passionate and often humorous contributions to the city council meetings and his unabashed courage and devotion to speaking truth to power. Thank you. On behalf of my mom, Mother Goose, Lola McGrath, our entire McGrath family. And in true George McGrath fashion, <laughs> before saying any words, all we can say is thank you. He loved this city more than anyone. His passion for Spokane was immeasurable. Mm -hmm. That's why he came to council meetings for decades. Every Monday night, mom got to do her hair, Dad got to come to city council. And at the end of the day, with all of the irritating press, the people that he annoyed, but the people who championed him and applauded his courage for speaking his truth and for his research, he loved the notoriety. <laughs> he loved it, and he loved Spokane, and we are so thankful for your recognition. Thank you, Cheryl. And then, Mr. Cathcart, we have our last proclamation is Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Do we have somebody that's going to receive it? No, we don't have anybody here tonight, but the mayor did deliver this in person over the weekend at the Heritage event. Perfect. So. Do you want to go ahead and read it? I will. City of Spokane Proclamation. Whereas on October 23rd, 1992, President George H.W. Bush signed into law annually proclaiming the month of May as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month to recognize and celebrate the rich cultural heritage and contributions of the Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI communities. And in 2021, President Joseph R. Biden updated the official designation to include Native Hawaiian communities, uh, AANHPI. And whereas AANHPIs have made significant contributions to the growth, diversity of culture, and vibrancy of Spokane throughout its history, and continue to enrich our community through contributions in many professions and fields, including those actively serving our nation at Fairchild Air Force Base. And whereas, despite the bitter hardships and political, social, and economic conditions in the United States throughout the years, many AANHPIs continue to settle in Spokane as immigrants, refugees, and United States citizens to make Spokane their home and contribute to the economic prosperity, cultural diversity, and civic engagement that makes Spokane a wonderful community. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I will just say uh, the mayor did deliver this on Saturday at the event, and it was another uh, amazing event that was put on. Um, they estimate somewhere around 25,000 people came through that event over the course of the day. 
And it's just wonderful to see folks getting back in person and attending these cultural events. It's just really wonderful to see, and I was really glad that I, I could be there and participate, so. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got all six finished. And uh, Dave Lucas, where are you? <laughs> all right, come on up. Mr. Lucas is going to give us a report on the Rockwood neighborhood. He is the neighborhood council chair and does an excellent job of recruiting folks to come to the neighborhood council meetings and engage the neighborhood. And we're very grateful to have him here tonight. Thank you. Before we get you going. Well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. It is uh, certainly challenging to follow the list of great members we've had attend and the great proclamations. What a wonderful group of folks that were here tonight. So many uh, Spokane traditions to be following. So always a difficult challenge. I'll come over. Do you want me to use that other mic? Switching mics. Ask me to use this mic. Um, but I do want to take a few minutes. Thank you for this opportunity this evening to come and talk a little bit about the neighborhood that I live in and love so much. And actually many of our council members, and I'm disappointed that Council President Beggs, who also lives there, was not here tonight to hear this and, and be able to participate, so I'll have to give him a hard time when I see him running around the neighborhood. We um, will, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to go over a variety of things. I'll be pretty quick, but uh, try to hit the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, the things that have been going well for us and the things that have not been going so well. I think it will be similar to what you've heard from many of the other neighborhoods, because I know many of these things as I talk to other neighborhood council chairs that are many of the similar challenges that they've been facing. So our boundaries really are, haven't changed, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Really uh, from Sumner on 12th to 29th, and then kind of east to west on Grand to Southeast Boulevard. Really is the neighborhood there on the south side of town. Uh, we unfortunately do not have our own park in the neighborhood. We have a couple of the Olmstead Triangle Parks, which are really neat historically. And we have a block, I'll talk about a little bit later, of the historical neighborhood and some of the significance uh, to that. We have one school, and that really makes it nice. But we really are built out, so there aren't a ton of infill opportunities, which I know was one of the items on the agenda tonight. Uh, as we look at things that change the housing makeup, uh, many times it doesn't affect us as much as it does other neighborhoods. So really kind of the big change we saw that most neighborhood councils saw was the drop off on attendance. So really we are down to about 24 regular voting members. We have 11 core members and really we're down to about 10 to 15 in attendance. Our high at one point in time was regularly about 44 attending. Really switching to the hybrid model as much as that technology is exciting and really has opened up the opportunity for some people to attend who might not. We also have seen that it also has really brought down the numbers that attend. So we have a hybrid model we'll at uh, Hutton Elementary School. So folks can attend there at the library in person. We basically put up a computer. It's not the uh, fanciest model. If uh, folks have been to the Hive and seen the way that system integrates, it's a much better system that the library put together. But for the neighborhood where we are, that is the most convenient centralized location there at Hutton Elementary School. We do have a large email distribution, as you can see, 535, down a little bit, but not dramatically. And our social media participation has actually grown over. But I'll mention this at the end, with a neighborhood of almost 800, 1,800 households, 1,800 households, that's not a great connection that we see. And so uh, it's one of the things we struggle with, really trying to connect with folks. And we've looked at different opportunities. Got a big block on here because we did not get our 2021 community event kicked off. We had for a variety of different reasons that it didn't go, uh, many of which were kind of the rollout of COVID and some of the challenges we faced and just some logistical issues with our scheduling. Um, but I will say it is a great opportunity and I encourage the other neighborhoods to look at that and not let that uh, deter them. And we actually are looking to try to bring that back this year with a smaller event. So it will be a smaller neighborhood get together. It's in the planning, whether it becomes something like a small ice cream party or an evening barbecue or something out 
we've talked about a couple different options. We have yet to settle on a date or a plan, so we're working on that. We are going to go ahead and ask from our uh, community development or community engagement grant is to include the Zoom, because that has certainly been a great facilitator, as I mentioned, not to, not to mention just for our full monthly meetings, but interim meetings, whether we have uh, the executive board meetings or other community neighbors who have questions who want to get together. It's a quick and easy opportunity to dial in and do that. We're also looking at doing a program this year with uh, door hangers. And so we're exploring the distribution, which is where the neighborhoods always struggle with. One of the things I would highlight, and uh, I have not worked this out yet, but it is certainly something the different neighborhoods can talk to, is if they have a Boy Scout or Cub Scout troop, the first two weekends of November are scouting for food. So they will be out in the neighborhoods, and so potentially partnering with them and seeing if we can't get some of those door hangers out to a wider distribution of those, close to those 1,800. Yeah. And then we've talked about the idea of an outdoor speaker to support the events that we do do and participate in. Something that has gone really well has been the neighborhood cleanup. So that has been a really successful program that I think most neighborhoods have benefited from and would encourage you as the council members who oversee that to continue that program and to keep supporting that as time goes on. We certainly this year did a little bit smaller. The numbers I don't think are that significant. We were able to get two roll-offs scheduled for this year in 2022. So the 3,400 of the 7,500 allotted will be doubled this year or some approximation. So we do ask, even though at times we don't uh, achieve the full amount allocated, to so continue to support that. Last year, we actually went over slightly, which is a little ironic. That was the first time we went over, and that was on the, during the middle of COVID. So I'm not really sure what that was about. But thank you very much for keeping this up, and I ask you as council members to continue that. That certainly is something that's a very good uh, opportunity for the neighborhoods. Traffic calming. This is something that hasn't gone very well. Um, if there's something that I would say has really fallen off over the last couple of years is the traffic calming program. I know there are some new efforts underway, but thus far, they really have not been very good. Um, our last big project that we did two years ago was trying to put in a speed table. It really ended up becoming more a speed hump. We're still waiting for the traffic calming study to be completed. The goal really with this was to slow traffic around Hutton Elementary School. Certainly one of the real dangers with people speeding is hitting a pedestrian. And even more egregious is hitting a child. So really that was one of our top issues of what we can do to slow down the traffic around the elementary school, particularly on that corridor, because that really has become, I know it was never designated an arterial. And in fact, the Olmsted brothers, decades or centuries ahead of their time, built that with traffic calming uh, mechanisms in the street to avoid that. It still has become with modern cars and with people's pace. They don't notice the speed. I don't really think it's malicious. I just think that the cars don't really give a feedback and you now you have electric cars which have no sound. So it just really becomes dangerous, for, especially around the schools. So that was a project we were really excited about. We're looking forward to seeing how the study comes up. There ended up only being one. There was supposed to be a bracketing of two was the recommendation from the street department. Uh, hopefully the study will provide more information and what that actually looks like and comes out with. One that we've had really tremendous amount of work has been put into, but has been really unsuccessful. It was approved under cycle 10, and that was a traffic calming program on 18th Avenue. Again, a tremendous amount of pedestrians there at the Rockwood Bakery, right off Manitou Park. That's where one of the main crossings are. And so it gets to be really crowded with people, again, trying to skirt around to get to Grand, ends up speeding. And again, the real critical danger is what happens if somebody gets hit. Kids out with people pushing baby carriages, um, kids walking, running from places, coming from the park. And so that has been a tremendous concern to us. The neighbors on the 18th have invested a tremendous amount of time and effort to do that. And I do appreciate um, folks getting together. We had a very good meeting uh, a couple weeks ago there to discuss that. We have put in, or I'm saying we, the city has put in new uh, monitoring system to try to get an improved study to make some decisions. But we would appreciate support to continue that program and your real attention to this program. This has been a real win-win for the neighborhoods, 
It's been really impactful, and I think it's probably saved lives over time. And over the last couple of years, it has really fallen down. It's really not been a successful program. And this isn't just from Rockwood neighborhood. I've talked to many of the other neighborhood councils. They've really struggled with the sense of communication, and we've really struggled with seeing progress and understanding how the process is moving forward. I know there are some work groups coming up this summer, and we look forward to participating in those and seeing how that unfolds. But please uh, put special attention to that and try to keep that moving forward for the neighborhoods. Historic Rockwood, as I mentioned earlier, this is probably one of the things that is a really neat, unique. Us and Brown's Edition really having that long-term historic neighborhood uh, being one of the original neighborhoods of Spokane. And so you can see the element that's marked out that is the national portion in there as well. And so we were working through, we've had a great relationship with the parks. We've done the uh, recognition of the triangle parks there that the Olmstead brothers put together. We are working now on a project on the trolley stop restorations. Mm -hmm. Similar to as you come up grand, you've got the watering trough that's been recognized with a marker that the city has done a great job to bring back some of the history and show that for folks. We're looking to do that with the trolley stops that come up Rockwood Boulevard. Mm -hmm. We have both a partnership uh, with Spokane Preservation Advocates and a neighborhood resident and our preservation committee to basically fund the first improvement and repair of the first traffic stop and to label it and start that process. So we're really excited about that. It is a great opportunity to really bring the neighbors together and get involved in something that everybody can be excited about and participate. So that's one of the things that we're very uh, uh, looking forward to, as well as redoing our historic map of the uh, designated historic houses. I know there are some of the neighborhoods who do walks. We've thought of that as an alternative down the future of really being able to do some historical walks. So we're excited about that and looking forward to that. We're very grateful to Spokane Preservation Advocates, mm -hmm. SPA, your parks, and, uh, and the neighborhood residents who've gotten involved to make this move forward. And as I wrap up, some of the things that didn't happen, I'm not going to go over this really busy, colorful slide. We tried to show things that we did, things we didn't do, and things we're working on. The thing we're still working on is the preservation, and many things that didn't get done, um, if you have interest or folks would like to see those at their own time. But what we are excited about is kind of our Phoenix project as we move forward and what we're going to do in 2022. So really working to continue to engage with the neighbors, participate, as I mentioned, in the traffic calming efforts that are going to be going on this summer and really trying to have a large active participation in those workshops, working on the historic preservation efforts, keeping up the parks, looking at what we can do to integrate that into the city's master plan, continue to maximize what we use with the neighborhood cleanup, dump passes, the roll-off events we have. It's a great opportunity for neighbors to get together, really working as a neighborhood council to support our residents. We make a real point to do whatever and to let people know if they ever need anything in the neighborhood to just make a phone call or send an email and we'll do what we can to get over there to help them, whether it's simply putting up a fence, getting trash to the dump for some of the older folks that aren't able to do that or to one of our roll off events or sit down and talk to them about the traffic calming efforts we have and then really trying to restart our neighborhood gatherings. So that's all I have pending any questions or any discussion from the city council. I really do, again, appreciate this opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about the neighborhood where I live and that I love and that actually many of our uh, so council questions? members are in as well. So thank you. Questions for? Just a quick comment. Sure. Uh, the Rockwood Neighborhood Council was my first one when I was appointed. I was back in 2019. And yeah, there was about 40 people at the Hutton Elementary School. And, but Dave, thank you, you've kept that group together. And if you miss a meeting, something's already going on. So it's just an engaged neighborhood, and it's just good to see that the neighborhood doesn't have to always wait for the city to do something. They are committed to moving their ideas ahead and then asking the city to partner. So again, just thank you for your leadership. I appreciate it and look forward to working more closely and in person, yeah. again, at a neighborhood council. So well, thank, and thank you. you. And thank you for your participation. Yeah. It's always yeah. nice to have you or Council Member Kinnear yeah. at our meetings yeah. and to be able to discuss and ask questions and participate. So I know it's busy. It's another night of meetings. I recognize that yeah. and I am grateful for the time you take to show up and do that. So thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? I will say, I know you think that participation has dropped off. 
you are probably the envy of many other neighborhoods because of the engagement that you've done personally and the amount of people who do participate. It doesn't seem like a lot, but trust me, there are some other neighborhoods that are probably mighty jealous about your success. So I thank you for that. Well, and it really is the neighbors. I, I, like I said, I love the neighborhood. I love being able to get out and talk to folks and uh, help folks out. Things like the cleanup of being able to interact with folks and do different activities is just a real blessing. And so I'm very grateful for all the neighbors that we have. And again, as I said, it's yeah. the neighborhood I live in and the neighborhood I love. So thank you for uh, the time to really speak in the yeah. town I love and at the city council. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, Ms. Fister, let's move on to the consent agenda. <clears throat> Did you wish to do the emergency ordinance first? We're gonna, let's do the or consent, consent agenda okay. first and then okay. emergency. Okay. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, value blanket with CompuNet, Grangeville, Idaho, for the purchase of Cisco hardware products, switch upgrades, identity, security appliances, phone server upgrades, and firewalls without bringing each purchase over the city purchase limit to city council for approval from May 16, 2022 through May 15, 2023. $350,000, including tax. Number two, master contract with Arch Staffing and Consulting. LLC Spokane for technical services in support of the Project Management Office and the Innovation and Technology Services Division from May 1, 2022 through April 30, 2024, not to exceed $150,000 annually. Number three, consultant agreement with DOWL LLC Redmond, Washington to provide analysis in the development of the new traffic calming program, $600,000. Number four, real estate purchase and sale agreement with Santa Lanes and Sellers LLC to acquire needed property for the SIA I-90 water main crossing, $130,000. Number five, low bid of corridor contractors, LLC, Avery Heights, Washington for the NSC Wellesley Avenue phase two Haven Street to Market Street project, $4,131,656.80 and administrative reserve of $413,165.68, which is 10% of the contract price will be set aside. Number six, master license agreement with Dish Wireless LLC, Inglewood, Colorado for placement of cellular equipment at multiple locations as a new vendor and site licenses acknowledgements for equipment to be placed at 2216 West Strong Road and 5717 South Park Ridge Boulevard, $76,800 revenue. Number seven, contract amendment with Catholic Charities to add funds to their supportive services budget line item to be used between April 1, 2022 and July 31, 2022. Increase of $60,000, total contract amount $279,869. Number eight, report of the mayor of pending, pending claims and payments and previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through May 6, 2022. Total $10,142,932.16 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $8,925,797.34. Number nine, City Council meeting minutes for May 2, 2022. Thank you. We have one person on the phone who wishes to comment. Dave, are you there? If you are raised to raise your hand, press star three. Oh, dang. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Dave, are you there? I'm here. Did you have a comment on the consent agenda? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure to tell you the truth with that uh, whole agenda thing, but um, I, my comment was going to be on the water uh, so proposal. Okay, so we're going to come to that in a bit. If you want to hang on, we'll okay. call you back. Thank okay. you. All right, any comments from council? It's an agenda. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Great. Consent agenda passes. We're going to go on to the emergency ordinance C36211. Ms. Sister, you're going to read that pretty much in its entirety. Correct. Mm -hmm. Ordinance number C36211, an interim zoning ordinance concerning the siting of indoor shelters for vulnerable and homeless individuals and families, amending Spokane Municipal Code Section 17C.130.100 on an interim basis setting a public hearing and declaring an emergency. Whereas pursuant to Spokane Municipal Code section 18.05.010 of the City Council has previously found that centers for the protection of vulnerable and homeless individuals and families during inclement weather is vital whether due to extreme cold, extreme heat, poor and quality 
air quality conditions, severe storms or other types of civil emergencies, and has further determined that providing protection to Spokane residents from extreme heat, cold, and unsafe air is an essential government function, whereas pursuant to RCW 35.21.683, effective as of September 21, 2021, cities are not allowed to prohibit indoor emergency shelters and indoor emergency housing in any zones in which hotels are allowed, whereas indoor emergency shelters are not currently allowed in the city's heavy industry, industrial zones and for various reasons are extremely challenging to site in the city's other zones. Whereas the City Council finds that many existing buildings that are otherwise suitable for providing indoor emergency shelters are located in the city's heavy industrial zones. Whereas the City Council finds that if conditioned appropriately, such indoor emergency shelters can be safely located in the city's heavy industrial zones. Whereas sections 35.63.200 and 36.78.390 of the Rise Code of Washington authorize cities to enact moratoriums, interim zoning maps, interim zoning ordinances, and or interim official controls without holding a public hearing. See also Matson versus Clark County Board of Commissioners 79 Wash App 641-904. P. 2nd, 317, 1995. And whereas pursuant to RCW 35.63.200 and 36.78.390, when the City Council adopts an interim zoning ordinance without holding a public hearing on the proposal, it must hold a hearing on the adopted interim zoning ordinance within in at least 60 days of its adoption. And whereas the City intends to implement the interim zoning ordinance contained in this ordinance and which amends Spokane Municipal Code Section 17C.130.100, and whereas the city also intends to conduct a work program during the pendency of this interim zoning ordinance to enable the city council to hear feedback from the public and interested stakeholders concerning a possible permanent am amendment to the city zoning regulations to allow the location of indoor emergency shelters in the city's heavy industrial zones. And whereas pursuant to WAC 197-11-880, the adoption of this ordinance is exempt from the requirements of a threshold determination under the State Environmental Policy Act SEPA because action needs to be taken immediately to, to allow placement of indoor emergency shelters in the city's heavy industrial zones in order to avoid an imminent threat to public health and safety and to prevent imminent danger to public and private property. And whereas the city council adopts the foregoing as its findings of fact justifying its adoption of this ordinance and documenting the existence, existence of an emergency. And whereas the city council finds that this interim zoning ordinance is necessary for the immediate preservation of the public peace, health, or safety, and for the immediate support of city government and its existing public institutions. Now, therefore, the city of Spokane does ordain section one interim zoning ordinance adopted and interim zoning ordinances adopted as specified in section six of this ordinance. Section two purpose, the purpose of this interim zoning ordinance is to allow the siting of indoor emergency shelters in the city's heavy industrial zones subject to appropriate conditions as specified. Section three, duration of interim zoning ordinance. This interim zoning ordinance shall be in effect until November 7, 2022, unless extended or canceled at the public hearing described in section four of this ordinance. It is anticipated that while this interim zoning ordinance is in effect, the city will evaluate whether to make these measures permanent pursuant to the public notice and participation process set forth in chapter 17G.025 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Section four, public hearing. Pursuant to RCW 35.63.200 and 36.78.390, the City Council shall hold a public hearing on this interim zoning ordinance on July 11, 2022. Immediately after the public hearing, the City Council shall adopt findings of fact on the subject of this interim zoning ordinance and either extend it for an additional six-month period beyond November 7, 2022 or cancel it. Section 5, severability. If any section, sentence, clause, or phrase of this ordinance should be held to be invalid or in unconstitutional by a court of competent jurisdiction, such an invalidity or unconstitutionality shall not affect the validity or constitutionality of any other section, set, sentence, clause, or phrase of this ordinance. Section 6, that section 17C.130.100 of the Spokane Municipal Code is amended on an interim basis to read as follows. Section 17C.130.100, Industrial Zones Primary Uses, A, Permitted Uses, P, Uses Permitted in the Industrial Zones are listed in Table 17C.130-1 with a P. These uses are allowed if they comply with the development standards and other standards of this chapter. B, Limited Uses, L, Uses Allowed that are subject to limitations are listed in Table 17C.130.1 with an L. These uses are allowed if they 
comply with the limitations as listed in the footnotes following the table and the development standards and other standards of this chapter. In addition, a use or development listed in part three of this division, special use standards, is also subject to the standards of those chapters. C, conditional uses, CU, uses that are allowed if approved through the conditional use review process are listed in table 17C.130-1 with the CU. These uses are allowed provided they comply with the conditional use approval criteria for that use. The development standards and other standards of this chapter, uses listed with the CU that also have a footnote number in the table are subject to the standards cited in the footnote. In addition, a use or development listed in part three of this division, special use standards is also subject to the standards of those chapters. The conditional use review process and approval criteria are stated in chapter 17C.320 SMC, conditional uses. D, uses not permitted, N, uses listed in table 17C.130-1 with an N are not permitted. Existing uses and categories listed as not permitted may be subject to the standards of chapter 17C.210, Spokane SMC. Non-conforming situation, situations. <clears throat> what follows is table 17C.130-1, industrial zones, primary uses. This table is on file on the city clerk's office as well as on the city's internet under the Spokane Municipal Code. The change to this table is under institutional categories, community service, uh, HI zone, heavy industrial, and PI zone, planned industrial, are changed from N to P. Section seven, declaration of emergency and effective date. This interim zoning ordinance passed by a majority plus one of the whole membership of the city council as a public emergency ordinance necessary for the protection of the public health, public safety, public property, or public peace, and for the immediate support of city government and its existing public institutions shall be effective immediately upon its passage. Thank you, well done. We have a few folks signed up. First up is Mr. Bocook. Three minutes, and Hannah Lee will be our timekeeper. Keep your comments respectful, um, and please give Terry a raise. Yes, give Terry a raise. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea how far to follow her, but <clears throat> um, now this has nothing to do with that Trent place, right? It had nothing to do with the place on Trent, the zoning thing. This is what we're talking. Come on, about. get on tune. Get in yeah. tune with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this has that nothing to do with the one on Trent, right? This is what we're talking about. This is the one on Trent. But we're talking about a zoning, zoning change. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, the only thing I was basically saying is that to me, I'm glad that you're looking to have more shelters, but I would just ask that people don't get sucked into something like they did with River Park Square, where you're, you're stuck for 30 years, you know, paying something that you shouldn't be paying, you know, whatever that may be. Um, that if you make any contracts with any of these private people, put some clauses in there that you can get out of it. I mean, that's what I'm looking at. Get, get, because uh, some of these opportunists, they want to rope the taxpayers into paying their way. And, um, and I know that uh, certain places, industrial places, you know, like there's going to be a time when I'm going to be walking with a cane eventually, you know, and I think about people that are disabled. <clears throat> uh, these places that you have, they should, like this place on Trent, there's no sidewalks. I mean, people people are going to get, if, if that place is one of the ones that opens, people have to be able to get to these places, you know, and is that, if that's not in there, it should not even, it, it should be part of it. There should be sidewalks. People should be able to walk to a place safely, you know. People with um, the little shopping carts, a person with a shopping cart should be able to walk there without going over bumpy ground. That, that kind of stuff. And I don't know if you guys are weighing that stuff out. <clears throat> and I hope they don't make it into a prison. <laughs> but if you're gonna make it into a prison, <clears throat> make, at least give them five by nine uh, um, spaces, you know, with their own toilets. If you're gonna do it, do it that way. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thanks, Rick. Um, next up is Clayton McFarland. Good evening, City Council and City Council members. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Clayton McFarland. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a citizen here in the city of Spokane. I'm a commercial property manager and broker with Goodale and Barbieri Company and president-elect and uh, legislative chair of the Building Owners and Managers Association of Spokane. I'm here to speak in favor of uh, hoping that you guys will pass ordinance number C36211 
Um, I think that our business community is united behind uh, the opportunity for uh, shelters to be opened in heavy industrial zones and uh, ask that you pass this. Um, there's adequate evidence to show that when a shelter is well run, that uh, many of the issues that people say that you shouldn't open shelters are taken care of. Um, and on a more of a personal note, um, in the last year, um, I convinced my parents, who are elderly, to move up to Spokane from Boise. Considered one of the safest and cleanest cities uh, in the Pacific Northwest, if not in the United States, with a population very similar to uh, Spokane. And lately, I've had to convince them that going down to sushi.com on a Friday night uh, to pick up some takeout might not be the best idea. Um, or if they do, maybe to let me go with them um, because I don't feel safe enough to send them on their own. And they possibly could be impacted by a zoning change like this. They live within less than a mile of um, an area that could be allowed to have a shelter that's zoned heavy industrial. And that said, I do think that uh, allowing zones in the, or allowing shelters in heavy industrial zones would make them safer than they are now. So I ask that you pass this ordinance. Thank you. Next up is Andrew Rolls. Well, good evening, Council President Pro Tem and members of Council. I'm Andrew Rawls, Vice President of the Downtown Spokane Partnership. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide a few comments again on this ordinance. A few weeks back, I requested uh, your consideration for getting this back on the agenda as soon as possible, as soon as possible if it didn't make it that night. Uh, it's good to see that it did get back onto your agenda in rapid fashion. Uh, and in following the developments of the last couple of weeks, uh, it appears that at least some of the details on the particular proposal for the East Trent site have become clear. Uh, notably, it's much more clearer to me now uh, that this ordinance uh, is a categorical change, allowing heavy industrial zone parcels to be places where community services can be housed. Uh, as with any other commercial property transaction, and as you well know, uh, the underlying zoning has to be correct before the parties will proceed with the, tra the transaction. A vote in support of this ordinance tonight is exactly that, uh, providing the correct zoning, uh, not only setting the conditions for the particular proposed East Trent shelter to proceed, but also allowing for the uh, general category of any future proposed emergency shelter and heavy industrial zone parcels to proceed. Uh, this doesn't limit options, nor would it commit the city to any particular proposal. Uh, that would, uh, it would merely add options. Uh, as for why the DSP supports the zoning change, we do so because our 2022 uh, policy platform recognizes what nearly everyone across the entire community recognizes, uh, which is that we need more shelter and more flexibility to meet the need. Uh, secondly, the effects of super concentrating emergency services and shelter um, in South Downtown over the past few decades have become much more evident. Um, the community has overshot the mark. Uh, and there is too much close proximity of social services in South Downtown, and, and that's created significant hazard for people who may truly want to turn their lives around but are taken advantage of by people who are only there to make a quick buck off of their addictions. Not to say that operating, operating shelters <clears throat> distributed in heavy industrial zone parcels precludes that, but there certainly is a growing list of social service uh, providers who recognize that providing service away from the South Downtown Social Service Hub contributes to improved outcomes for the people they serve. And this includes the UGM Men's Shelter, VOA's Crosswalk Youth Shelter, Salvation Army's Way Out Shelter, the Cannon Street Shelter, and the proposed move of the House of Charity. Um, thank you again for the time to speak tonight. I truly appreciate the fact that you've, you've brought this on and bringing this up for a vote, and I, and I ask for a yes vote. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Rolls. Mr. Batten. Welcome. Three minutes. Good evening. I was not planning on being here this evening. Um, I understand today at today's administrative uh, meeting, you guys agreed to move this forward as an emergency ordinance. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for understanding and recognizing how important this is. Um, as a former member of the Plan Commission and the current member of the DSP and chair of the DSP, it's important to understand the distinction between a rezone of a particular location and the change of the use use chart. I mean, this is this is industri heavy industrial zones, irrespective of any one individual locations or even the economics of that location. It is my belief, as with a number of other business owners, that heavy industrial zones are appropriate for this type of use, 
for a shelter use. And to exclude those is, is probably inappropriate at best. And so I appreciate you guys bringing this forward again tonight and supporting the idea of doing shelters in heavy industrial zones. Um, I appreciate uh, Council Member Bingle, President Beggs, and everybody here tonight to reconsider this and move this forward with that understanding. It's not about any one particular property, but allowing this use in a heavy industrial zone. I think that's an important distinction that we all need to understand and appreciate. So a vote yes tonight would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Kogan. Welcome. You have three minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President, members of the Council, Roy Kogan. I'm here on behalf of Hello for Good, and we urge adoption of the ordinance. Uh, we also would like to thank the Council for all the work it's done to get us to this stage. Uh, it's been a lot of work, and we certainly do appreciate that. And it's our view, as you've heard before, that the adoption of this, of this ordinance doesn't commit the Council to anything. It just creates optionality going forward and selecting the appropriate place, the appropriate site, when the council makes that determination. So it creates more options. So thank you for your very hard work. Uh, we support it, and we look forward to working with the council closely in helping solve our homeless problem and population. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Kogan. Christopher Savage. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, right. Uh, before we go to entire council comments, I'd like to ask Councilmember Wilkerson, who brought this forward today, if she would kick it off, start us off. Thank you, Councilmember Kinnear. So, in all thy getting, get a good understanding. So, when this came before council about three weeks ago, I did not support it because all I asked for was could you give me the total package? It did not pass. The community went ballistic. Going forward, I'm going to vote for this, but I still got some concerns about the changes after speaking to other businesses in the area. But this zone change has stopped a critical conversation. We're not talking about cost. We're not talking about sustainability. Still no numbers. Still no lease, and it still feels like a blank check. In June, this council will have to approve contracts for a crosswalk, transitions, Catholic Charities, the Guardians, um, there's a couple more, and they are telling me they need gap funding. So we got existing providers who are doing great work saying they can't make it, and now we're having this other entity that we have no idea what the cost is going to be. So finding funding is going to be an ongoing issue. As finance chair, I thought it was my responsibility to look out for the citizens. It's like, what's this going to cost? And I've been surprised that the business community has not asked this question also what is going to be the bottom line and what will be the sustainability. So I brought this forth today as an emergency ordinance. I am going to support it. I'm encouraging my council members to support it because we can't seem to get off of this when we need to move on to the next conversations that will be critical about this shelter and how we provide services for the citizens of our city. Thank you. Next is Councilmember Stratton. I'll just be very brief. Um, I'm following um, Councilmember Wilkerson. I will support this, but I do want the citizens of this community to understand exactly what she said. We have no idea of costs for this, um, so we're waiting for that. My heartburn is the uh, letter of intent that the mayor signed with Catholic Charities that also puts us in a um, responsible position relocating Catholic Charities and f helping to fund five years of uh, program programming for Catholic Charities. So this is a big deal. And um, I represent Northwest, Spok Northwest Spokane, and, and I'm trying to keep my constituents um, notified of what 
this is all going to cost because that's um, what I think that I should be doing is making sure that people understand there's a cost to all of this and we're taking on an awful lot and I'm very very concerned about it but I will um, support this and but I want people to understand that we have no idea what this is going to cost we have no idea the uh, repercussions from the mayor's signing of the letter of intent with Catholic Charities. Um, so we're going to have to kind of, you know, float along and see what all this, what what we're we're spending here because I'm I'm starting to lose sleep over over this. So I just want people to be forewarned. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I've um, I, I shared a lot of comments on this back uh, when we voted the first time, and I supported it then, uh, as well as when the. Uh, uh, shelter capacity resolution was brought forward. So I won't, I won't add too much there, but I, I did just wanna point out that I talked to the administration this morning and they have assured me that June 6th, they will be providing a full package of all of that information forward to public safety. Um, it's kind of impossible to know all of the costs right now until those RFPs come in and that is Thursday. So about 10 days from this Thursday, the city will have a pretty clearer view of what the costs are gonna be on the operating side. And then we will have a hearing on that at our public safety committee uh, on June the 6th. So please tune into that. I would also just add, I think it's really important, obviously that we are <laughs> scrutinizing costs and doing so really closely, but the costs and the zoning change have no correlation. There's no correlation between the two and we can have two separate conversations on those and get to the bottom of it. Um, and frankly, I would just say, if we were as, if we scrutinized all of our contracts the way we're scrutinizing this, we'd probably spend a lot less money as a city. Yep. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, yeah, we, we still don't have numbers. Uh, you know, there were some, uh, um, some issues with the first RFP that, you know, we've, we've brought to light. And I certainly hope that in the next, uh, in this current RFP, um, that uh, we have above board um, actions and making sure that everything is done ethically. Um, and when it comes to what's the cost and business owners not asking what's the cost, I, I think the, the cost comes with every broken window that our business owners have incurred, uh, damage that they've been shouldering for the, uh, the cost of the damages, the, uh, um, the cost of losing employees for not wanting to work downtown, the cost for not wanting to, um, there's a lot of costs that they've carried. And so when it comes to the idea of what's the cost, I know that they can probably quantify in dollars and cents exactly how much it has cost their businesses and how much they have stepped up for this community in that regard outside of uh, when it comes to this partnership, um, I have seen businesses stepping up and writing checks out of their own pockets to uh, to try to find a way to make this happen. And so um, when it comes to that, uh, you know, I went um, to a business here in town. Their, um, uh, their building had just been broken into again. It, it, it's happened three times already this year, and every single time it cost them $10,000 because what happens is people are breaking in and stealing the copper from their uh, from their AC units. And so... When it comes to what, what's the cost, I want to personally thank the business owners in this community who have, through no fault of their own, had to shoulder a burden that they should never have shouldered um, by themselves. And I'm thankful for the ways that they are stepping up to write checks out of their own pocket. And I look forward to uh, the rest of the community engaging in this uh, situation so we can go forward. Um, last time we only had four votes uh, to pass this. I want to thank uh, Council Member uh, Wilkerson, Council Member Stratton, Council Member Zappone uh, for what I believe is going to be a yay vote on this because I think it does help us move the process forward to get to the conversations that you're talking about um, that are going to be very important and are going to be um, rightly scrutinized and we'll make sure that we do the best thing that we can do for uh, the community given the situation that we're in. Thank you, Council Member Zappone. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to be supporting this and glad that we could be moving forward for the next phase of the discussion. For me, it was all about collaboration and seeing that the, the administration has updated their criteria for the shelter contract and incorporating some of the best practices that we as a council have approved. I think the RFP process has improved throughout this process and that we are on the direction towards a better uh, potential shelter. There are still a lot of unknown questions that have been raised. And so I'm going to support the zoning change and look forward uh, to continuing to collaborate with the administration on a holistic approach to homelessness. So I'm hoping going forward that we're going to be seeing um, a holistic package that includes pallet shelters and safe parking and other things, not just the Trent shelter alone, 
but a holistic approach to this because we need to see the whole idea of the funding for it going forward. Um, previously, I had not seen a lot of collaboration from the administration on this, and so I wanted to pause to make sure that we were actually talking to each other to bring this forward and seeing that uh, the administration wanted to respond and wanted to collaborate. I'm, I'm excited to keep moving forward in this process. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perkins, I see you in the back um, scribbling notes. So do you want to come forward and say a few syllables? You know, we mentioned, Mr. Cathcart mentioned a June 6th uh, date. Do you want to address that at all and tell us what next steps are? Sure. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem, Kinnear, members of the City Council, Council Members Pone, thank you very much for those kind words on behalf of the Mayor and the Administration. Uh, we do want to be collaborative. We do want to be working with this Council, the business community, and all the residents here to make sure that we're moving this forward on a path that respects the integrity of how taxpayer dollars are used. It also respects the integrity of those that are most vulnerable that we're trying to provide the services uh, to move them forward. So what we're, what we're looking at doing, we are uh, hopeful that on June 6th at the Public Safety and Community Health Committee, we would come forward with both the uh, RFP recommended provider and the summary of what those costs would look like for your consideration. In addition, we hope on June 6th to come forward with the lease in a form that you can consider and hopefully move forward as it relates to the terms of the lease, the monthly rent and other contents within the lease that both the landowner and the city would be obligated uh, to perform under its terms. So uh, we're looking at doing that June 6th, as Council Member Cathcart mentioned, uh, next week the RFP is to be submitted from those who are interested in, in submitting proposals. Then there'll be like a seven day period or such to kind of review those proposals or RFP committee uh, to make a recommendation and then moving forward with both of those items on the 6th of June at the public safety and community health meeting. Go ahead. Thank you. I want to go back to the word transparency because during this whole process, some council members were cherry picked for information and had it and some did not. I will say as finance chair, a lot of information I did not have, and I didn't think, that's why I was not in support of a lot of this. It's like, the person who's trying to help keep the city financially whole, and I was the last person to know, it's not all about me, but we, I feel it's my responsibility going forward. So if the administration is not gonna be transparent with all council members, Mr. Perkins, then I have concerns about that, and I'd like the administration to really be cognizant of that going forward, of information, how it's shared and who it's shared to, and when it's shared. I want to apologize, Council Member Wilkerson. Uh, I, I, I own that as the city administrator who is responsible for operations and also has a fiduciary responsibility to not only the mayor, but to all of you as council members and the taxpayers of this great community, that lies at my doorstep. We will improve on that in the future. That will not occur again as long as I'm city administrator, so we will work to definitely improve that. But that lies at my doorstep, so I wanna apologize for that. Uh, I have been working very hard with our chief financial officer and our staff to look at those numbers very carefully, very diligently, because any expenditure of taxpayer dollars is very critical and we must do it wisely. But I also wanna make sure that when we come to forward with a recommendation for you, it's backed up by facts, it's backed up by where the numbers are, and we have the various elements of an RFP and a potential provider and a lease in place where we can share that financial information as well as the content of, of those agreements. And so, again, I wanna to apologize to you, Council Member Wilkerson, that's on me. That will not happen and occur again, and we will do a much better job of being more communicative as it relates to these kinds of conversations, not just on this topic, but on the global discussions we have with you on many issues throughout the city. Thank you, as we have a director of a budget in our office, if we were in partnership with that, a lot of these things would not come up to this type of uh, conflict or disagreement because we'd be walking in tandem, making those decisions, and I'll be keeping council up to date as we go forward in the budgeting process. So it's like, we need options. First of all, not a one and done, but really, as we go forward, it's really, we're in this together. And if we take that approach, I promise you we'll get there sooner if we take that approach. And that's why I appreciate this outreach today in terms of the collaboration and your patience with us 
in terms of having that dialogue. And we've been having greater dialogue and we're gonna do a better job with the council's budget officer to make sure those kind of conversations take place. Again, like I mentioned, not only on this topic financially, but all the various issues we deal with, particularly as we start to look forward to the budget for next year and some of the other topics that involve taxpayer dollars that we wanna make sure that we are collaborative with you. That's the commitment on the mayor and myself as city administrator and the taxpayers of Spokane. But this sentiment should apply to both sides of the house. It's, Absolutely. It's a two-way street, not a one-way. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Senate Administrator, are we going to see some plan or costs associated with the House of Charity on that January 6th meeting? I will. You mean June 6th? June 6th, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You're giving me quite Lots a few sooner. months, sir. Thank you. <laughs> let, let, me get, let me get back to you on that. I, I have to, I'll, I'll need to check with our Chief Financial Officer and to find out what that looks like and where, where those are. So right. before I can definitively say, yes, we will have something on June 6th, let me go back and check and I will communicate with your office and the rest of the council on what that, that looks like. I don't have that answered this evening. Okay, because part of this, again, is the whole picture. And the mayor announced on April 27th that we were in partnership. She signed a letter that said that the city would be talking about fully funding the operations of a new chair, house of charity for five years in, in conjunction with the county and others. And so it's been more than two and a half weeks since we've seen an update on that and we've been asking for information on that and we've received nothing. And so when we were talking about this collaboration and transparency, that's what we're talking about is not this public statement of the future, uh, of this future commitment of millions of dollars without talking and collaborating with us. Understand. And, and to point out that particular case, funds, funds to be released for that still have to go through a request for a proposal process, an RFP. It's not exactly. guaranteed you're going to get X million. It's there's a process that you're going to have to go through. But I understand, Council Member Sapone, you want us to help define what that process is, what it looks like, and, and, and I will return to you in this council to make sure I can outline exactly yeah. what those steps are. Well, I was just going off of the letter that the mayor signed. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or, for Mr. Perkins? Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, Council you President Pro Tem. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, for staying and gracing us with your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from Council? Prepare to vote. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Let's go on to Resolution 0046. Ms. Fister, please read that. Resolution 2022-46, honoring Spokane Police Detective Juan Rodriguez for his extraordinary act of bravery and her her heroism on September 11, 2020. And we have uh, Mr. Peace, you have signed up. Would you like to come forward, please? Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, a Spokane resident and a 22-year police accountability expert. This resolution involves an officer-involved fatality. <clears throat> so at this point, I'd like to take this opportunity to honor the victim's life by saying his name, Joshua Clayton Bryant, 31, was shot and killed on September, 20, September 11th, 2020 by Officer Juan Rodriguez who is the first SPD officer to be struck by gunfire in the line of duty since 1991, in which a SPD captain was struck by gunfire following a high-speed pursuit that began in Stevens County. So at this point, I would like to take this opportunity to honor and praise Officer Rodriguez for his service to our community, as well as to honor his sacrifice of the blood and pain that he endured in this officer-involved shooting. SPD released body camera footage of this shooting back in August on YouTube with the time mark of 1211. This shooting was ruled justified by the prosecutor, which the Spokane Prosecutor's Office has not found issue with any deadly force incident in this country, county since 2013. Joshua Clayton Bryant was the 53rd person killed in an officer-involved fatality by Spokane law enforcement in 26 years. Seven other people since Mr. Bryant's death have now died at the hands of uh, law enforcement, making a total of 60 people who have died. Mr. Bryant had family and friends that loved and cared about him, just like the many other grieving fa families that have been impacted by police violence for over the past 27 years. 
who have been hoping and praying that some sort of police accountability takes place with this force, police force. Yet nothing has been done until about two months before Mr. Bryan was death. It was then that uh, June 20, 25th, 2020, the city council released its 24 point uh, public safety reform agenda yet to be voted on to this day. These 60 family impacted family members like Joshua Clayton Bryan's families are counting on the city council to pass some kind of police reform laws. So again, the question remains, will this city council go forward with any kind of police reform measures? If not now, when? Rest in peace, Joshua Bryan, Eric Mahoney, Nicholas Clausen, Nancy King, Sean McCoy, Fahim, Fahim Glixier, uh, uh, Peterson Camo, and David Novak. Thank you, Mr. Peace. So, Mr. Bingle, Mr. Cathcart, you're sponsoring this. Do you have anything to say before the rest of us speak? Yeah, I, I was um, excited to champion this resolution because um, what Detective Rodriguez did was absolutely heroic. It was an extreme demonstration of bravery and professionalism in some very intense circumstances. And it is National Police Week. And with it being National Police Week, I wanted to honor uh, Spokane Police Department because, and I wanted to honor Detective Rodriguez because I think he is an example of the hundreds of great men and women that we have serving and protecting this city. And um, if they are all half as brave and, and professional as, as Detective Rodriguez is, I feel really good about the hands that we're in. And uh, so from, from us, I think sometimes, um, you know, you can go without appreciating a body that does a, a great service to the community. And with it being National Police Week, I thought it would be a great opportunity for us as a body to resolve to say, we appreciate you and we support you. So that's why I brought this forward. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, I would just, just to piggyback on that, I just wanna thank Detective Rodriguez and thank the entire police department for just everything they do to keep us safe. I think we have some of the best trained uh, officers in the country, frankly, and um, they get better every day and every year, um, and I'm just grateful for that. So I'll leave it there. I just really am appreciative of, of what they do and, and how hard they work, especially given that we just don't have enough of them. Mm -hmm. Any other council member comments? We have some members from SPD. Would one of them like to say something? Would one of them like to say something? Here we come. Could you introduce yourself? I can try. Okay. <laughs> good, good evening, uh, uh, members of council. I'm Assistant Chief Justin Lundgren. And I wanna thank uh, all the members of council, uh, council member Bingo and council member Cathcart for uh, bringing this forward, this resolution. Uh, every officer involved shooting is, is truly a tragedy. Um, but I, I, I commend you for showcasing the bravery that uh, Officer Rodriguez displayed in this case. And thankfully, uh, his injuries were not more serious than they, they obviously could have been in this circumstance. Um, <clears throat> and I do think that it's representative of the many men and women that we have, uh, the, the blessing of having patrolling our streets uh, day in and day out, 24 hours a day, keeping all of our families safe. Uh, here with me is Captain Hendren. He is the investigative uh, commander. He is also, uh, was here um, on uh, Detective Rodriguez's behalf because unfortunately he is out of town attending training and wasn't able to be here today. Would you like to say anything? I'll just, uh, I'd like to uh, also uh, uh, champion what the chief said. I want to thank the council again for taking this time to honor Detective Rodriguez. Uh, it was uh, truly a, a harrowing experience uh, with what he went through and I appreciate uh, your time and honoring him. So thank you. Thank you, appreciate your time coming down. Any other comments from council? So I did not know it was Police Appreciation Week. Next year, let's have a salutation to that because it's a lot more inclusive and a bigger deal sometimes. So let's put that on your calendar, Mr. Bingle, for next, for next year. And let's prepare to vote. Seven, six, oh, good job. Next up is uh, 0047. 
Resolution 2022-47, supporting the Spokane Regional Food Action Plan developed by the Spokane Food Policy Council, which identifies needed strategic investments to preserve farmland, increase local food processing, provide healthy food for all, and reduce food waste. Okay, we have several, more than several people signed up, starting with Kristen Angel. Come on down. Welcome. You Thank have you. three minutes. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to be heard. And I'd also like to thank the Spokane Food Policy Council for creating this remarkable document, the Spokane Regional Food Action Plan. As a consumer, I took part in the forums that informed this plan, and I was impressed by the diversity of expertise that contributed to it and just how well it was run in general, especially during a pandemic. So hats off to them. I'm here to ask for your support for this plan. This effort will connect diverse food system partners and unite our community around shared goals of better nutrition, health, and economic prosperity for our community. This shouldn't be a politically divisive issue because everyone needs access to healthy, affordable food. Food insecurity here is higher than state and national averages, and th that was the case even before COVID and the steep rise of inflation. These are uncertain times. We can no longer afford to assume that our community will always have access to the global food market. We need to build a more sustainable and sustaining local food economy, and we need to start today. The political climate today is so divided, but people from various political viewpoints can support our leadership prioritizing food security, especially at this time. I'd like to mention that I am an acting member of the Sustainability Action Subcommittee and that this work do dovetails nicely with the strategy one in the Sustainability, sustainability Action Plan North, uh, Natural Environment Chapter, which reads, work with regional partners to align natural resource management. And the, act the following action item 1.6 is almost I identical to the request in the uh, regional Food Action Plan for an economic study of our food production sector. So I'm asking you to support this plan with your vote today, but I'm also asking that you act, you act to take a seat at the stakeholder table in an intentional way. Please get engaged in this effort and its implementation. Some of you may remember the LEAF project. Um, I was one of 20 volunteers who worked for two years to try and help the city figure out a way to purchase the old campus farm in Vinegar Flats, uh, which made up a quarter of the last 200 remaining acres of prime farmland in our city. We couldn't find a path forward, but I learned a lot by being a part of this process. What's most relevant to share tonight, I feel, is the need for the city to improve relationships with the other food system partners, the county, nonprofits, growers, sellers. We can't meet the potential gap in food need in our community without collaboration. We are down to 150 acres of prime farmland in Spokane, and it's too expensive to acquire easily. The city really should start building bridges with other food system partners so we can create a more resilient regional food system. Supporting the, the regional Kristen. food action plan is a good start, and please consider engaging in its implementation. Please support this important work. Thank you. And thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Tori Foote. Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you, Council Members and Council Member Stratton Kinnear for bringing this forward. It's real important to us. I am Tori Foote. I'm a realtor and a micro-organic farmer up in Colbert. I was a founding member of the Spokane Food Policy Council in 2013, and in the eight years since that started, in my one little area, a block around Burnhill, we now have five farms that have been sold to developers. We're about to see 100 houses come on, each in their 10 acres, and we've lost at least 600 acres of prime growing land. This will not feed us and it won't be recoverable and I find that terrifying because this is not just in that area, it's all through our region. Farms are going fast and farmers deserve the break. They need the retirement, they need to get out, but we have no way of passing that on. 
They used to come in as um, to get the farmland. They worked the land, but that's not available anymore. Younger people who could physically work the land don't have the money to buy the farm. And I think um, with our region, we have some of the best soils anywhere and could actually grow fresh, whole food, vegetables and animal, not only for this region, but for at least the whole state, if not further. But we do very little to make that happen. And in fact, we work to do the opposite with our apathy. Our farm, my farm, used to raise 25 turkeys, 25 meat chickens, and other fowl to sell locally, all organic. But this year, we're not doing it at all because there's no more processors. And it's just too much for us to manage that. And uh, there's a lot of people that are giving it up. And it's, it's going to hurt all of us locally. I know of others thinking in the same way and, and wishing we could continue, but that something has to happen. And it's not something that just I can do or this little group that made this great plan. But that coupled with the excessive least expensive feed that's happening now and the gas prices and things, it's pushing us all out of the out of the bark. We can't keep doing it. So approving and adopting this plan is a good step in the right direction. We need to encourage young farmers the way vets on the farm trains vets, or the other idea like the Franks hiring a farmer to tend an entire farm with a salary and built in support. I mean, those are great ideas, and we need to look for more of those. We need to come together as a whole region to make this happen. It's really critical. So I thank you for your interest. Thank you. Appreciate it. Kylie Pybrus, did I say that right? Okay. Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you, council members, and thank you, council members Stratton and Kinnear for supporting and bringing forth this resolution. My name is Kylie Pibus. I joined the Spokane Food Policy Council in 2018, and I will be the incoming president following Chris Ostrander's leadership. Our regional food action plan represents the voices and experiences of 352 Spokane residents, like Kristen, these residents are farmers, local food processors, distributors, food pantry volunteers, waste managers, educators, and consumers. Through community forums and a food system survey, their feedback identified four priorities for our region, preserving farmland, increasing local food processing, and making sure that healthy food is available for all and reducing food waste. I joined the Food Policy Council to advocate for people experiencing food and nutrition insecurity. I coordinate one of two federal nutrition programs in Spokane through Washington State University Extension. I want to share a story from our nutrition program that highlights the need for our plan's priority of healthy food for all. We established a partnership with a women's recovery home through Union Gospel Mission. Women were preparing to join their families as they worked to recover from substance abuse and gain life skills. Our WSU nutrition educator delivered more than 12 hours of hands-on education. They planned meals, made delicious recipes like hummus, stir fries, and smoothies, and identified food resources in their communities. We were also lucky because three local food pantries that were supported by Second Harvest Food Pantry Network provided fresh produce like berries and salad greens. After the class, the women reported feeling confident to return to their families and have new skills to feed their families. And this is what happens when stakeholders come together, as outlined in the Healthy Food for All priority. The Food Policy Council was formed in 2013 with leaders like Tori Foote, and because of Spokane City Council's commitment to fostering a resilient food system. Since then, we've secured funding from the Regional Health District <clears throat> and recently the Smith Barbieri Foundation. We ask that you formally support our plan to show our neighboring cities, the county, and numerous partners identified in our plan that we are committed to an equitable and resilient food system. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. Niles. Yeah. Did I get that right? Is it Niles? Nils. Nils, sorry. Nils Johnson. Nils Johnson, <clears throat> welcome. You have three minutes. My name is Nils Johnson. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm here representing uh, my role in the Spokane Food Policy Council. 
But to give you my a little background, I work for Rural Resources Community Action as the Food Systems Program Manager, and my job is to find ways to feed local people who need food with food that's produced in the area. I previously worked for uh, Stevens County Extension as the Food Systems and Ag Coordinator, and uh, prior to that, I managed the Chewila Farmers Market for six years, starting in or ending in 2016. I wanted to share with you some of my experiences associated with the food processing, that um, the ideas that have been put forward in the food processing section of the food plan. I was responsible for, um, I'm the lead, the chair for that section. And uh, so I wanted to share a couple of personal experiences I had. When I managed the Chuila Farmers Market, prior to that when Cottage, Washington State's Cottage Food Law came out, we had at least a dozen low-income entrepreneurs who are ready to start producing some kind of food product in their home kitchens. And when that rule came out, it turned out to be not useful for any of them. And to my, to my knowledge, there are still not a single cottage food law licensee in the Stevens County, Ferry County, Ponderay County region. So clearly there needs to be work done on that rule. I also wanted to mention to you that um, Tori mentioned uh, chicken processing as a limitation. L the, all of the farmers in our area have a, find a limitation in the processing that's available for for other meat animals, hoofed animals, and pork, beef, primarily pork and beef. And uh, one of the things that I have experienced personally is having to turn down donated, professionally raised animals that were going to go to food pantries because we could not find processing for them. Hoofed animals are required to be processed in a, w, a USDA, like federally licensed facility. It's very expensive to get one set up and uh, their capacity is just not there. So uh, that we have a, a recommendation in the food plan for looking at ways to use existing state law to expand use of what's called a uh, a, um, a WSDA custom license facility of which there are many more and it's much less expensive to get licensed. I don't consider this to be a food safety issue. It's primarily a legislative issue. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, N Nils. Pat Mutz. Welcome, Pat. It's so nice to see you. You have Thank three you. minutes. Actually, I should give you 15, but you only get three. <laughs> well, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, that just points out that I have a long history with the council over various projects. Um, I uh, was a founding member of the council. Uh, I worked on the ordinances to allow for uh, sheep, goats, and pigs to be in the city. Uh, the uh, market garden ordinances over the years. Um, I'm now speaking as a private citizen as I retired from WSU the first of the year. <coughs> At, in that position, I was the small farms and urban ag coordinator for WSU Spokane County Extension. And I wanna speak to a couple of points. Number one, when um, the pandemic hit in 2020, it was our local food growers who provided the, the emergency boxes to feed people who had been thrown out of work. They rallied together, they went through their resources and we fed the community. Um, and that, that cannot be ignored. Our small farmers in this area are scattered, yes, and they're not huge, but they are an, an economic force in this community that needs to be respected and needs to be encouraged. I echo the comments that Tori said about farmland. We have no mechanism in this county for preserving farmland or finding ways for young people who don't have the money to buy a huge chunk, uh, you know, lay out a ton of money for a piece of property. There's no mechanisms for being able to make that land affordable. And as Neil said, we have limitation on processors, which means our locally grown cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens have no way of getting into our community food system 
uh, because there is a lack of, complete lack of uh, uh, processing or a lack of uh, being able to get it in. And I would really appreciate if uh, you folks would support this. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. Thank you. I think it's Stephanie, but it could be Stephen. Stephanie, okay, come on down. Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie Watson. I also go by Stevie. And I'm here to offer my support of the Spokane uh, Regional Food Plan through the Spokane Food Policy Council. I have had the pleasure of being part of the council less than a year, um, but I've said during this time and the work plan meetings I've been involved in, I'm just so impressed by the level of coordination and collaboration and input of all levels of our food system from food access and food donation um, and better coordination in that regard to, to our, as been already mentioned, farmers and food processors and the challenges that they are facing that directly impact us being um, an agricultural hub. So um, I, I just really highly encourage all of you to read the plan and offer full support of the plan. Um, I think it's a really good starting point for where we can go um, as our regional food economy expands and becomes more known for the intrinsic value that we cannot replace once gone. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Uh, we have Janelle on the phone. Is it star three star? So Janelle, could you press three star? Star three. three. Sorry, star three. I knew I'd get it backward. Star three, raise your hand. You're there. She's there. Janelle, welcome. You Thank go you. Ahead? You want to go ahead? Um, yes. Thank you, Council Member Kinnear and Council Member Stratton for bringing the plan forward and to all council members for their consideration. My name is Janelle Harvey and I've had the honor of acting as the program director for the Spokane Food Policy Council since 2019. My work has been to coordinate the research and development of the Spokane Regional Food Action Plan. I request your support of our Regional Food Action Plan. This plan brings food system stakeholders together to work together on local food system opportunities, including, as mentioned, farmland preservation, increasing local food processing, healthy foods for all residents, and reducing food waste. The initiatives in the plan were identified and prioritized by local community members and food system stakeholders. Personally, I have concerns regarding housing developments being proposed on prime agricultural land in our region. With climate changes, it is expected that Washington State will need to increase its agricultural output as a result of our access to prime soil and water. I urge the Council to support the Spokane Regional Food Action Plan which provides the framework for, from which policy conversations and stakeholder partnerships on important issues such as farmland preservation can emerge. Thank you for your consideration. Janelle, thank you. And does she press start? She's okay. good. She's done. All right, thank you. Um, we have Phil Small who's um, virtual. Phil, are you there? Okay, here I am. Hi, Phil. Good you to see me? you. Yes, we can. You want to go ahead? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, council members, for the, this opportunity to express my support for Resolution 2022-47. My name is Philip Small. I reside at West 7th Avenue near Cedar Street, and I serve as the Agricultural Interest Representative to the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. And I was involved in the Food Policy Council in 2013 through 2015. And I have to say that this plan has everything in it that those of us involved back then were hoping for. It has all the elements uh, to build a healthy regional food system. And this is as much about keeping our food dollars working in the community as it is about access to healthy food. The the uh, economic benefit of holding on to those dollars is just tremendous and it really drove 
the Food Policy Council formation back uh, 10, 10, nine years ago. Uh, as someone who works in agriculture, I know the urban agricultural elements of the plan are critical to our community and beyond building capacity and resilience, having our citizens, our children involved in growing food, getting our hands dirty, makes for a well-grounded citizenry. And in my view, that's a natural resource we have just too little of. And so it's not just an investment in the, in the land base needed for urban agriculture, it's an investment in ourselves. And I would like to say that the local food processing elements are particularly critical. As you heard from Tori and Neil, there are regulatory barri barriers to fully using our locally grown food, barriers that are, are within the political realm to solve. And so I very much hope that you will support this, um, this uh, special resolution. And as a member of the Solid Waste Advisory Committee, I really take to the waste reduction elements uh, listed on page 17 and 18. These are points that I, I will be advocating for while serving on the SWAC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Okay, uh, Councilmember Stratton, you were one of the co-sponsors. Did you wanna lead us off with comments? I just wanna thank everybody for coming down and speaking. I know that sometimes it's hard to uh, end a long day and come down to council and sit and wait to have your turn to talk. So I really appreciate it. And um, I would just um, echo you know, the concerns with available farmlands and the processing piece. I know that I have a, a family member who lives up in Chatteroy on 10 acres and uh, they farm and raise um, cows. And I know that that's been an issue with them as well when it's time to um, do the processing is finding, you know, finding that local person that can do it and that they can afford to pay to do it. So I'm just glad everybody's here. I'm glad to be talking about this. Um, and it's, it's nice to, to um, look at this as trying desperately to do something for the future and for our families and for the community. So I'm, I'm really glad you're here with us. Other council member comments, go ahead. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming down. Somebody at the start of this kind of talked about how this isn't political, et cetera, and they're right, it's not. There's nothing political about it. Um, and I think regional resiliency is something that's really important and something that we overlook consistently, uh, whether it's issues with, uh, you know, WashDOT being seriously understaffed and unable to clear the passes so that food and, and other needs can get over the pass in a timely manner, whether it's issues like COVID and other, crises that we might be facing, causing supply chain issues that are affecting us. Uh, regional resiliency is really, really important and something that we have to focus on. And, um, you know, issues like the processors, we should be looking at ways to incentivize processors to be stood up, uh, whether that's through, you know, tax incentives, whether that's through lobbying the legislature, whether that's through um, other, you know, resources that we can invest at the, <clears throat> at the local level. Uh, you know, if that's a need and that's an obstacle then we need to be trying to find ways to address it. Uh, farmland, I, I think you know, it's really important that we start talking and having a real serious conversation with our legislators around amending urban growth policies so that we can preserve farmland, especially in the midst of a serious housing crisis. Um, we are gonna have to have that conversation at the state level to make that um, doable, but I'm more than happy to participate in those conversations because it does make a lot of sense. Um, you know, one that's going on right now, I don't think anybody is unaware there is a significant issue with baby formula. Now, uh, thankfully, my wife and I are able to somewhat get around it, although it is affecting us a little bit. Um, and we're gonna start transitioning our little guy sooner than we had expected as a result of that. But, you know, things like that, we should be in a position to be flexible, nimble, that we can stand up uh, a way to respond to those things immediately because it has a massive impact on our community members and um, just the, the local economy, the lo I mean, just everything about our area. And so I, I'm, I'm happy to support and, and I don't, and I think there's a lot of further elements and pieces that, that we need to be talking about. Um, and, and these are things that are gonna help with jobs. They're gonna help with uh, you know, economic growth and it's just an important conversation. So I appreciate this coming forward today and happy to be a part of those conversations going forward. Go ahead, Mr. Bingle. 
Yeah, so my great-grandparents and my grandparents have, um, you know, raised cattle for my entire life. I grew up uh, spending summers helping uh, uh, on their farms, and so I understand the importance of, of local farmers and um, what they bring to the community. And um, food security is, is a really big deal for any region. For, for a city our size, that's a hub for the region. Uh, making sure that we have, um, you know, secure access to food is a uh, is a really big deal. And as we're talking about, you know, processing plants and how expensive they are to get up and going, um, around the country right now, we've seen actually a lot of processing plants burning down or, you know, being destructed uh, for one reason or another. And so processing is taking longer right now. So investing in a local solution, I think, is a really good idea. And I really look forward to seeing how we encourage um, local uh, city farmers, uh, you know, in their backyards to be growing their own foods, to be growing their own vegetables, because um, one of the, the district that I represent has, um, uh, you know, um, pretty heavy low income element and EBT dollars actually go twice as far at local farmers markets. And so um, we can help low income folks actually get access to good quality uh, local foods um, to help, uh, you know, with their diet and their dietary needs. So I'm excited to support. I thank you for, for championing this and, and bringing it forward. Anybody else? I'll just say thank you all again. I echo that but food insecurity has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate this because it continues to elevate the conversation. There are still some that don't know people don't have enough to eat at night. And in the land of plenty, the United States of America, that we are still facing that struggle in many of our communities today. So uh, I support it, will help elevate it to get the word out there and then look for solutions to move it forward so we don't have people go hungry just because of barriers that are man-made. So thank you. Okay, uh, just comment. I was privileged to attend the first meeting, the Food Policy Council way back when. I wanna say it was 2015, but I could be off by a couple of years. And I'm so heartened to see that it's going strong and being productive and successful. And I would urge you to continue to stay in touch with us so that we can help any way we can. And, and Mr. Cathcart mentioned resiliency in the, I, in the uh, I-90 corridor, but there's a bigger issue when you think about California and the drought that's happening there. And we are going to be facing food shortages from California, which is one of the biggest producers of, the, of our food system. So we absolutely need to stand up more uh, support more farms, people who are backyard gardening. We have an urban farm ordinance that council passed that can help people uh, augment their incomes, but also feed others. So please stay in touch with us on a regular basis. If it's you need to have a meeting with us or just a phone conversation, please reach out. Feel free to do that. Um, and I absolutely support what you're doing. I'm just thrilled that you're you're engaged and moving forward with this. So thank you. All right, let's prepare to vote. This is great. Another one, 6-0, thank you. All right. Ms. Fister, on to 36208. Ordinance C36208, changing the zone from neighborhood retail 35 NR35 35 to neighborhood retail 55 NR55 55 for property located at 2921 West 8th Avenue, 2019 S 2918 West 8th Avenue and 2937 West 7th Avenue in the city and county of Spokane, State of Washington by amending the official zoning map. We don't have anyone signed up to speak. Any council commentary? The zoning change was just to increase the height and density of that area towards housing. Okay, prepare to vote. Okay, folks, we're on a roll. Thank you. And we have some first reading ordinances. We have three first reading ordinances. And the first is 36209. 
Ordinance C-36209, Establishing Water Conservation and Drought Response Measures, enacting a new Section 13.04.1925 and amending Section 13.04.300 of the Spokane Municipal Code. We have, well, let's see, three people signed up. First is Gina McKenzie. Welcome, Gina. You have three minutes. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to address the council tonight. And um, can I just have an aside to ask. There was somebody else that uh, evidently thought the sheets, the sign-up sheets were out until the ordinance came up, and they weren't, so they were not able to sign up. Is that uh, a problem for that person to... Is that person still here? They can come next week as well. Yeah, they're here. He's, I think he's still here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, if that's okay, I'll uh, maybe if, you can start. If they're my... still here, we'll add them at the end. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll let him know if he's still here. Or he just disappeared. I don't know why he disappeared. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, I just heard about this water pro. Evidently, there's a problem. And I heard about it on KXLY News that just this last week that this ordinance is, was being proposed. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to address the council. So, um, so my understanding is that the proposal would be to put the citizens on rationed water and allow certain days and certain water uh, hours and days for watering and that citizens should not, uh, you know, say spray their sidewalk down like they might do once every month or so, or their driveway. And I'm just not understanding what the need is for because I wasn't aware that there is a water shortage here. We have a brilliant aquifer. In fact, when we water our lawns, the water goes right back into the aquifer. So I'm not, under I, you know, I'm just totally not understanding why uh, there's a problem here or why this, this is being proposed. To my knowledge, we're not in a drought. In fact, I saw on creme.com today that we have record waterfall. And so I think we're very fortunate to live in this area. This isn't Arizona. And I certainly believe in conservation. I mean, I always, in the movie, the Meet the Fockers, you know, where they, the <laughs> I can't think of um, uh, the name of the actors, but they're you know very famous actors. And the you know if it's not if it's Yellow what's the line line it's um, <laughs> if it's if it's brown flush it down. So I totally go by that myself. Just you know it's a personal anecdote, but um, so I believe in conservation. I think water's important, and I think we should take good care of our resources. But I'm totally not understanding. Um, that there's a water shortage here. And certainly if we did have one, we should address it and we should, uh, you know, regulate um, things. But right now we're in great shape. So um, I just wanted to leave that with you. And I would respectfully uh, request that you vote no because right now there is no water emergency uh, that I understand. And again, certainly if there be, does become a, an emergency, it should be addressed. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, next is Sunny Mace. Are you here? Oh, there you are. Come on down. Welcome. You have three minutes. Okay. Thank you very much for um, having me share my thoughts and I've um, been a resident of Spokane for over 40 years and I've always had a strong interest in water use issues and environmental issues for my whole life. And so um, the Spokane area as nobody has you know missed has been growing a whole lot over the last 10 or so years you know spreading all the way to Coeur d'Alene and so as the city grows, there's going to be more and more of a demand on our aquifer and the river. 
And we have to really be watching that pretty carefully at this point because we are also not getting the same kind of precipitation that we have gotten over the years. I mean, um, I'm somebody who's been out to like Turnbull for decades and a lot of the ponds that are out there or that were out there are now just swamps or grassland. So we are gradually drying in this area. So we have to kind of be careful about you know, how we are using water right now so that we will have the water going forward for generations, you know, hopefully. Um, the problem that's happening right now since we aren't getting the kind of precipitation that we have had in the decades past is that the aquifer, which is an amazing gift because it does recharge, but if we're not getting precipitation to, you know, um, recharge the aquifer, then we really are going to be facing more and more water problems down the road. And so it's, I think it's really, really important that we do take the steps now to do what we can to conserve the water that we have. And like last summer was, you know, of course, really bad, but we've had some pretty severely, you know, brutally hot summers in the last five or six years. And so, um, you know, hopefully this year won't be quite so bad. I mean, we've had a pretty nice wet spring, but, you know, we don't know what's down the road, you know, in a month or so. Um, so um, I would really like for you guys to be able to support any kind of conservation measures that we can. Um, my other point that I want to bring up is that I also live right by the Manitou Park area, and Spokane is blessed with just amazing parks, and it's, it's really a gift. But if we do implement some kind of a water conservation thing, we have to also you know, make sure that every department of the city and businesses and, um, and the general population understands that they can't be like watering when it's 90 degrees outside and, you know, that's, that's the worst time to do it. And I have sadly seen at Manitou water sprinklers going like all the time during the rain on the streets. And this has been, and I see that with businesses too. So, I mean, if, if this ordinance goes through, there's got to be changes with the park department and it's got to be made clear to the population as well that, you know, they can't be putting out their sprinklers in the middle of the day. So, so and, you know, your three minutes are oh, up. I'm up. Okay. I really appreciate you coming down. Okay. Well, thank you for waiting for this to whole me. meeting to be over before you testified. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, it was really important to me to share my thoughts thank and you. I appreciate you. Um, supporting this because I think it's really important for our region. Thank have, you. Have a good night. You too. And I'm wondering if Dave is still on the line, if you press star three, Dave. Yes. Dave. You there? Yep. Dave, you want to go ahead? Hello, sorry that uh, automation was talking in my ear. That's all right. Um, I wanted to comment on this uh, proposal on the water also. Uh, I've only heard from the news, so I don't know a lot of the, you know, behind the scenes details, but when they say we're using more water than the rest of the country, I'm really wondering what uh, studies have been done you know, what we've looked into, why would we be using more water? Are we flushing our toilets more? Are we washing our hands too much? Do we have more in-ground pools in other cities? Or is it a matter of, you know, our lots being bigger than a lot of the other cities? So I don't think we're comparing apples to apples when we're looking at this. Um, I'm also wondering if we've looked at how much water leaves the plant and then how much water is going through the meters and how much are we losing due to leakage? Is there a problem there? And I would also ask that when you do consider placing restrictions on watering, it would only be fair that the city, the parks, and all other facilities be required to follow the same rules and restrictions. We all like our green lawns. We all love our green parks. 
but it would not be right to implement rules for thee, but not for me. If the city decides to restrict the public's water use, then the city should be the example, not the exception. I would ask that before we do anything like that, that we try to educate rather than intimidate or mandate. And you know, we don't need to be having a water police going around. So I haven't received anything from the city in the mail uh, saying how to conserve, you know, there's water timers that you can buy for your hoses. Um, my sprinkler system has, is a smart system, so it knows not to water on rainy days. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of things that can be done rather than jumping all the way to this point. I'm all for conservation, but I think this may be going too far. So I would ask the city council to consider looking at education and different avenues before coming after you know the homeowners and and restricting and putting rules on on the homeowners so i appreciate your time and i would urge you to vote no on that and try and find some other education rules or you know platforms and see how that goes first thank you very much i appreciate your time thank you dave Okay, Terry, do you want to move on? Council to President Pro Tem? Yes. I, I believe that last testifier oh. is in the audience. Okay, so sorry, to... Gina, do you have, I can't really see that far right back. Here. Yeah. Okay, looks like Bob Apple. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council. Matter. I did want to speak on this issue. Uh, Rathroom Prairie Aquifer is what you're really talking about. It's the biggest, one of the biggest in the world, uh, fed by the Rocky Mountains and uh, no shortage of water. And according to Krem, none this year either. Uh, if we ever do get a shortage, we'll be the first to know because you just need to look at the river, the Spokane River. As you know, in August, it drops really low and it does because it, it, there's an intercross between the aquifer and our river. And so when the water level drops or our aquifer drops, you would literally see it. Uh, so what I'm getting at is that we don't have a shortage. We're not likely to have a shortage. I believe we have about 13 pumps here in the city that pump water to the residents throughout the city. Water comes from the aquifer. There has been no filtration of it. Uh, it, it meets high standards. Uh, I remember when I was on the council, I tried to get it designated FDA quality water, which it is, so that it could be used for commercial use, but that didn't happen. Maybe you guys can do that. <laughs> In any case, we have, uh, we're, we're extremely lucky here in Spokane, and that's why we love our community. We do not have a shortage of water, and I hate to have anybody say we do. We're not the Southwest. We're not Seattle. We're not anywhere else. We are very, very lucky, blessed to have the Spokane Aquifer. And for that reason, uh, we do use a lot of water. And, and old studies will show you that it, it, we water our lawns. And we water our lawns. A lot of the soil here just sucks the water right back down. And when it does, it goes right back into the aquifer, which means, hey, you guys are really overbilling us. You know, I might consider asking you to reduce the bill, but you're, you don't have to. I guess we'll live with what we got. But I am saying that, you know, 99% of the water that we dump on our yards, and we do, goes right back into the aquifer. So it's a reuse, and it's a good one, and we're really not hurting the natural system at all. We're helping it. And fortunately, we've been very studious, and we will hopefully continue to be, to prevent pollutions from the surface from getting right into our aquifer. We've had some problems up on the West Plains. They have a different water table situation, and I hope that uh, those can be corrected. But fortunately, we've been lucky, and where we've seen problems, we've corrected them. And with regards to some comments I've heard, uh, you people are probably well aware of the purple pipe situation, recycled water. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's set up now that all of our parks are now using, or most of them are using, the recycled water. It's supposed to be. <laughs> She's shaking her head. No, sorry. Well, the goal, it is the goal. I hope it's still the goal to reuse uh, recycled water almost or all of our parks. And some other 
places that are high water use that okay. don't, they're not drinkable, potable water. So Mr. Apple, it's so nice to see you again. Thank yep. you for coming down. And uh, your three minutes are up, but I appreciate you coming down. Council President Pro Tem. Just a, a, a question I would throw out for, um, I'm not sure who the right staff person would be, maybe Kara. Just wondering if we could get for next week when we vote a rundown of the various public engagement uh, efforts that have been done on this. There were two, at least two people tonight who mentioned they hadn't heard anything about this and they may not know that in fact this council approved this policy a year ago uh, as a voluntary measure. Uh, and I, have, I didn't see one public uh, discussion of that. I didn't see any sort of, of uh, marketing push by the city to educate people on that. And so I would just like to know what we did over the course of that year to educate people, to prepare them for this very significant change that we'll be voting on next week. And, and I'll have that for you. It was about a year's worth of outreach, extensive outreach with not just CARA, but the Sustainability <clears throat> Action Committee, um, my own assistant, Jacoby, at the Riverkeeper. I mean, it was, it was pretty extensive, but we'll get that for you. Um, Terry, let's go on to uh, 36210. Ordinance C36210 relating to commercial vehicles amending Spokane Municipal Code Section 16A.44.100. Okay, and the last one we've already done was the interim zoning ordinance. So we have a few folks signed up for open forum. First off is Rick Bocook. Good evening. All this serious stuff, you know, I got to share a song with you. I'm not going to sing it, but I could. <laughs> um, this is a song from uh, 1999 by Tom Waits. It has a religious connotation to it, you know, but um, and maybe it'll cause people that look at religion to maybe lighten their hearts up a little bit and quit being so darn serious and judgmental. Okay. Well, anyway, it goes like this. Don't go to church on Sunday. Don't get on my knees to pray. <clears throat> Don't memorize the books of the Bible. I got my own special way. I know that Jesus loves me, but sometimes a little more. Because on Sunday morning, I go to the Sierra Police candy store. Now, it's got to be a chocolate Jesus that makes me feel good inside. Got to be the chocolate Jesus that keeps me satisfied. I don't want no Abba Zabba, the one no almond joy. It's the chocolate Jesus that's suitable for this boy. And when I need a pick me up, it's better than a cup of gold. Chocolate <coughs> Jesus satisfies my soul. And now, when the weather gets rough and it's whiskey in the shade, it's best to wrap your Savior up in cellophane. And if he gets all money, that's okay. Pour him over ice cream for a nice parfait. It's got to be the chocolate Jesus. That keeps me satisfied. Chocolate Jesus all over the world. Get your candy bar, people. Thank you, Rick. Um, next up is Anwar Peace. Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, a Spokane resident and a 22-year police accountability expert. On Friday, the Spokane <coughs> Police Department announced to the media they ne immediately needed 13 to 50 more officers due to staffing shortages. This was even after the City Council back in March passed their ordinance adding 10 more officers, which in fact I didn't didn't oppose that, that ordinance because the police force is woefully understaffed for, the, for Spokane be, being the second biggest city in the state. For far too long, the city has had the belief that our community is like the town of Mayberry on the Andy Griffith Show with a small police department of only 356 officers, which in fact we should have around 700 officers for a city this size. Plus, for far too long, the city has had the belief that our community is like the Andy Griffith Show's town of Mayberry, which, in fact, can be seen in the department's own hiring practices. Like the department's hiring practices of a lot of 
officers with characteristics like Mayberry's Deputy Barney Fife, who can't shoot straight, but we hire them onto this force. We should be instead hiring candidates that more display characteristics of Mayberry Sheriff Andy Taylor. So with that being said, I do support vastly increasing the staffing levels of the police department with a few caveats. First, in order to increase staffing levels, the city must revamp the department's recruitment practices, hiring practices, as well as the department's officer early warning system. The early warning system is designed to flag problem officers. And our system is based off of Seattle PD's system, who is now spending $300,000 to revamp their system due to the many flaws they found in the system because of the police union's meddling. So the Spokane Police Department should do the same by revamping the system. The final caveat is this. To keep employment as an officer, it is time for SPD to initiate random drug and psychological testing for all uh, department personnel. I think a lot of rudeness from officers and unprofessional, behavior, <coughs> unprofessional behaviors as well as misconduct is a direct result of officers not dealing with their stress properly. properly. It doesn't take a big incident for an officer to develop psychological issues. All the little things they go through after time can build up and manifest itself in disastrous ways. Instituting these random drug and psychological testings will show the public as well as officers and their families that the community wants them to be safe and healthy as they patrol our streets of Spokane. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peace. Sherry Barnett. Welcome, Sherry. You have Thank three you. minutes. President Pro Tem Kinnear and all the rest of City Council. You know, I'm really glad that I was here tonight. 49 years with the fire department should be honored. And all those girls with the lilac, they were so beautiful and wonderful. And there is no parade that I like like that one. I mean, the horses, the lights, the dogs, the, the bands. But above all, that last, the very last part, where you have people and they're marching with huge banners of people that lost their life fighting for us. and. It's a parade, like no, I, I love parades, and I don't know one that compares to the Lilac Parade. I love it very much. And that you honored George tonight and his wife and daughter, that was beautiful too. I really still am kind of on my same pitch though. Um, I. I find it troubling, and it's not just here in this. I mean, it's, it's a thing that is happening almost worldwide, where we have a kind of a tyranny. And I saw it in what happened with the firemen. I, I'm going to go back over to the abortion issue and then just show you the difference in how people are looking at things. But as Dr. Seuss says, a who is a who, no matter how little they are. And absolutely, in my family even, I know of a, of a couple. She, got a, she wanted an abortion. He begged her. He said, I will hire a nurse. I will take care of the baby. And she would not. So he divorced her. That child was not part of her body. And... Yet, because someone has reasons to not want to take an injection, people are willing because someone up above you, but they're not above God. A who is a who, no matter how little they are and no matter how big they are. And human beings must be respected. They must not be throwaway. That's what happened to the Jews under Nazism. And I do love this city, and I think you're all trying hard. God bless. Shalom. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you coming down. Okay, that is.
the end of our meeting, I want you to all give yourselves a round of applause for a six, six zero <laughs> evening. Thank you all. You've done a wonderful job and you haven't been a bother at all. So I do appreciate that. Council member. I'd just like to take a moment of personal privilege to thank council member pro tem Ms. Kinnear job. for conducting the meetings over the job. last three Thank weeks. And she's been amazing. It's the only reason we all agreed was because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. You, you want to cause me heart That's <laughs> leadership right there. I really yeah. appreciate that. So our next meeting, uh, as this is my last one for a, while, uh, well, for a long while, um, Council President Beggs will be back next week. That is May 23rd, 28th, 23rd. And until then, have a great week, and we will see you back here at 6 o'clock. Meeting adjourned.